In case you aren't familiar with the mini mill, let me quickly go over the basic parts of the machine and introduce some of the terms that I may be using during the video. This is the table and whatever you're working on here, which is often called the workpiece, is normally clamped down to this table or held in a milling vise which is clamped to the table. The table can move side to side which is called the x-axis direction or front to back which is the y-axis direction and then the head can be moved up and down which is the z-axis direction. So you have the ability to form very accurate precision shapes in three dimensions. This whole assembly here is called the head. Mounted on top of the head is the motor and it has a belt drive that runs from the motor over to the spindle. The spindle is a hollow shaft that runs through the center of the mill and tools can be inserted into the spindle. For example, this Jacob style drill chuck, but this is where you would also insert your end mills or other tools. Back here we have the column and the three spoke hand wheel. And by turning the three spoke hand wheel, we can move the head up and down on the column. The full length of the table is about 18 inches or 460 millimeters and the width is about four and a half or 4.7 inches and 120 millimeters. Running along the front of the table is this uh, scale calibrated in inches and sixteenths of an inch and it is generally used uh, for centering work on the table. The slot in the front of the table here is used for mounting physical stops that are used with a power feed option that we'll look at later on. The table has three T-slots and of course into the T-slots go these T-nuts. For this size mill these are typically have a 3 8 by 16 thread and they slide into the T-slot and can be positioned wherever it's convenient to bolt something down such as a milling vise or a clamp to hold a workpiece in place. Looking down below the table here, you can see the uh, diamond-shaped cross-section of the end of the x-axis gib. I often call it a gib strip because it is in fact a strip of metal about six inches long. It rides in between the two parts of the dovetail with the gib adjusting screws over here. You can adjust with some degree of precision the amount of clearance between the two sides of the dovetail. Next we have the x-axis gib adjusting screws. You can see there's four of these and they each consist of a sort of a large set screw and a lock nut. The objective of these screws is to butt up against the gib strip to apply just enough pressure so that there's minimal clearance between the gib strip and the dovetail of the table. That ensures that the table stays very accurately parallel when it's moving left to right while providing enough clearance so that it's not binding. With a brand new mill, as it's wearing in, you may find that you need to adjust these screws every week or two or maybe once a month or so, depending on how frequently and how aggressively you're using the mill. But after the first year or so, and things have worn in pretty well. Uh, usually it's only every few months or maybe twice a year that you need to make any adjustment here. So as the mill wears in over years of use, you can compensate for any wear and uh, retain the original accuracy of the mill. So this whole metal block here that the table is resting on is called the saddle. The dovetails for the x-axis are cut into the saddle so it moves left and right. When the y-axis is moved, the entire saddle assembly carrying the table moves in and out front to back. And of course that also is uh, riding along a dovetail and it has its own separate gib strip and gib adjusting screws so that the y-axis movement can be adjusted just like the x-axis movement. And here we have the x-axis locking handle and it is turned clockwise and just pressed down by hand or thumb pressure until you feel firm resistance and that presses up against the gib strip which is back behind here to apply pressure to the dovetail and lock the table securely so it won't move in the x direction. Underneath the table here you have the y-axis lock which works the same way uh, but in the y direction. 
Now one feature of these handles is you can pull out here and they're spring loaded so you can rotate them around uh, to find a more convenient position. For example, if you happen to find it locked up here where it's going to be in the way of something, you can just pull out on that and turn it down and set it to whatever position is convenient for your work. Most work on the mini mill is uh, measured in units of thousandths of an inch or hundredths of a millimeter, depending on your choice of units. And for that you need much more accurate control. So the hand wheels have calibrated collars. The collars are calibrated in thousandths of an inch. So if you wanted to make a cut that extended for ten thousandths, you could just turn this dial by ten units. You could also start with the cutter up against the edge of your work then you can rotate this collar to set it to zero so you have a reference point and then uh, from that point forward you could turn it how many ever thousands you want to move. So if you wanted to advance the workpiece towards the cutter by ten thousandths you could uh, start for example at ten and just turn the dial until you get to twenty or if you wanted to go another ten thousandths it turn it to 30. Now as we come around we'll go to 40 and 50 and 60. You'll notice that at this point the dial looks a little strange because you have 60 and then you have what looks like two and a half thousandths and then zero. So when the designers of the mini mill uh, were working out the details back in the 1990s they chose to use 1 16th inch thread pitch or 16 TPI for the lead screw and that's what led to this unusual situation but on this machine we have built-in digital readouts and so in practice you'll probably never refer to these dials the y-axis hand wheel is set up uh, pretty much the same way as the x-axis with the calibrated collar down here and this uh, rubber accordion like thing if you're not familiar with it is just a chip shield that keeps chips from getting down into the lead screws underneath here so as you turn the y-axis hand wheel, those accordion devices, one in the front and one in the back of the table, expand or contract as needed to cover up what would otherwise be open spaces down to the lead screw. While we're on the subject of motion control using the hand wheels and the lead screws, it's important to talk a little bit about backlash if you're new to machine tools, you need to know about backlash and what it is and how to compensate for it. It's really very simple. It's just some dead space when you turn a hand wheel where the corresponding table or whatever it is you're trying to move is not moving. So I've set the hand wheel so that uh, the 20 is lined up with the reference mark here. And as I start to turn, the table will move to the left. But now if I stop at 50 and I reverse direction, there's a range of motion here on the hand wheel where the table isn't moving. And you can tell because the amount of drag is greatly reduced. But if you go far enough, then the table starts to move in the other direction. So that dead space or gap between moving in one direction and moving in the other direction is what we call backlash. And it's usually expressed in thousands of an inch or hundreds of a millimeter. I can easily measure that backlash on this machine. If I turn in one direction until I get to 10, and if I now reverse direction, I can uh, feel after about six thousandths it starts to re-engage. So on this x-axis slide, the backlash is about six thousandths. Now another way we can visualize that and even more accurately is to look at the DRO. So I'll turn the hand wheel until the 10 is on the index line and now we'll go up and set the DRO to zero. I'll slowly turn the hand wheel in the opposite direction while watching the DRO until I see a change in the DRO reading from all zeros. So if we look at the dial now we can see once again it's about six thousandths that it moved before the table moved. Up here on the DRO you can see that the x-axis moved by just two ten thousandths. So as soon as I saw that change, I stopped turning the hand wheel. So the important takeaway about backlash is that 
anytime you reverse the direction of movement of the hand wheel, you need to go a little extra until you take up that slack. Otherwise, your reading will not be accurate. Now, the good news is that the digital readout eliminates the need to be concerned about that. The digital readout does not change unless the table itself actually moves. That's another reason that digital readouts can really help improve your work in the shop. And while we're on the subject, let's go ahead and check the y-axis backlash. So I'm going to turn the hand wheel clockwise and I'll stop at the 20 mark. And now I'll zero the DRO and now I'm going to turn counterclockwise until the DRO moves. And there it is. The backlash in this case looks like it's about eight thousandths. So we have about six thousandths of backlash in the x-axis and about eight in the y-axis. I briefly demonstrated earlier in the video how the three-spoke hand wheel can move the head up and down much like a drill press. And the hand wheel is used primarily for drilling operations as opposed to milling. But it can also be used in milling operations if you want to lift the head up to change tools or just to get the tool out of the way to clean off some swarf or whatever. Maybe you want to remove your workpiece from the vise to take some measurements. So it's a nice to have this uh, quick way to move it up and down. And as on the X and Y axes, there is also a lock for the Z axis. If you're milling along a surface or milling a groove or something in a workpiece, you always want your the head of your mill to be locked so that it doesn't migrate down by vibration. But when you're doing milling operations, you need much more precise control over the height of the head. In order to get that fine control, you push the three-spoke hand wheel inward until it engages. There's a sort of a castellated cog here that engages these two pieces. And now you can use the fine feed control over here to lower the head very accurately and precisely in increments of a thousandth of an inch. You can quickly switch back to the other mode if you want to raise the head up out of the way or lower it back down. The calibrations on this fine feed are a little bit different than on the X and Y hand wheels and they go from zero up to 60. <laughs> but again, since we have digital readouts, that's not of too much concern because we'll be using the digital readout to measure the depth but the divisions sometimes are useful just to gauge the approximate movement of the head downward. And I've actually put a little index mark here on the side. The uh, normal index mark is up top here, but I find this one easier to work with because it's more visible. The other thing that's apparent when you use it is that this dial has a lot of backlash in it because it's connected through a linkage with some joints back here to a gear arrangement. Backlash just means that you need to turn it in the direction you want to go, in this case downward, uh, and make sure that it's engaged fully before you rely on it for taking any measurements. But there again, with the digital readout, you'll only see the movement when the head is actually moving. So backlash becomes less of a concern. And then down below here, we have the sensor for the digital readout, and it rides along this linear scale to... Uh, magnetically read the position of the head with great accuracy. On the front of the column you can see the rack that is the, one half of the rack and pinion arrangement that engages with the hand wheel to move the head up and down. You can also see that there is a dovetail here so the head remains accurately parallel and square with the table at all times. As with the X and the Y axes there are gib adjusting screws here and uh, they take up any slack or wear with the dovetail so that you can maintain very close tolerance of the head and the dovetail over many, many years of use. And I think I mentioned earlier that these machines can easily uh, last for 20 or 30 years or more. And you may wonder uh, what my basis is for making that claim. Well, I'm currently working in a shop at a high school robotics team, and we have a mini mill from late 1990s, one of the first made and sold by Grizzly and it works just about as well as uh, when it was brand new. 